Hello, everyone, and welcome to Finnegan's webcast, Trade Secrets in the Pharmaceutical Industry. I'm Megan Myers, and I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to welcome our presenters, John Williamson, Shana Sear, and Max Gianelli. John is a partner and patent attorney in Finnegan's Washington, D.C. office. John leads the firm's IP specialties practice group, and his practice involves serving as lead litigation counsel on complex disputes spanning a wide range of technical subject matter areas, including pharmaceuticals and medical devices. His practice focuses on IP litigation and counseling with particular emphasis on patent infringement and trade secret misappropriation actions before U.S. district courts, arbitration panels, the ITC, and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Don is also a former chair of the D.C. Bar Trade Secrets Committee and previously served as judicial law clerk to the Honorable Liam O'Grady at the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia. Shana is a partner and patent attorney in Finnegan's Reston, Virginia office. Her practice focuses on complex patent litigations before the U.S. District Court, contentious proceedings before the USPTO, and strategic counseling on patent, trade secret, and related FDA law issues. Shana holds a PhD in chemistry, and she previously served as judicial law clerk to the Honorable Kimberly Moore at the Federal Circuit, and as legal intern to the Honorable Noel Hillman at the U.S. District Court for the District of New Jersey. Max is a patent attorney in Finnegan's Western Virginia office. Her practice focuses on patent and trade secret litigations in federal district courts and at the US ITC. Max represents clients across a wide range of technologies, including pharmaceuticals, specialty chemicals, and chemical manufacturing processes, to name a few. Max holds a PhD in chemistry and previously served as judicial law clerk to the Honorable Kimberly Moore at the Federal Circuit. Before I turn things over to our presenters, I invite everyone to participate by submitting questions. This is an interactive webinar, so just click on the red Q&A button at the bottom of the webcast interface and type your question into the Q&A window and then click Submit. We'll answer questions today during the Q&A session at the end, which will take place uh, at the conclusion of the presentation. You can enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking on the green Enlarge Window button on the top right side of the slide window and the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow webcast help guide button in the lower center of the webcast interface. Mm -hmm. And now I'll go ahead and turn it over to John, Shana, and Max to begin the presentation, Trade Secrets in the Pharmaceutical Industry. Uh, thank you, Megan. Uh, so it's, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Megan mentioned, we'll be discussing trade secrets in the pharmaceutical industry. And we've broken our talk up into three segments. Uh, first, I will be discussing identifying trade secrets in the pharmaceutical industry. And then Shana will discuss protecting trade secrets and avoiding disclosure. And finally, John will wrap it up by discussing enforcing trade secrets in state and federal courts. So to start things off and to make sure that everyone's on the same page, uh, we have here the definition of a trade secret that applies under federal law and the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. There are basically two requirements. Uh, first, the information needs to have been the subject of reasonable measures to maintain its secrecy. And it also needs to derive independent economic value from not being generally known or readily ascertainable through proper means. So for example, the type of information that may not qualify for trade secret protection could be you know, information specifically found in a patent, published in the scientific literature, or uh, features of a product that can be readily reverse engineered. So it's important to keep in mind that reasonable measures are actually part of the definition of a trade secret. So they are a bar that you have to clear if you want to later enforce your rights to the trade secret in court. Now, what a reasonable measure is is highly fact-specific, and it depends a lot in part on, on the type of technology or information that's being protected. Uh, and you'll hear a lot more about ways to protect uh, trade secrets in the next segment of our talk. But, but for now, I wanted to include a, a quick note on non-disclosure agreements. And we, we received a, a, a question during the registration process about uh, protecting trade secrets in the context of collaborations. So companies um, do this all the time. They collaborate and they have non-disclosure agreements in place to protect their technology and to, to make sure that their trade secrets and any information they share should, should remain confidential. And later, you know, if things go wrong and they try to, uh, you know, assert trade secrets in court, Courts will look back at those non-disclosure agreements to see, you know, um, were appropriate measures taken to, um, to keep the, the trade secret information confidential. 
And so the, these agreements often, you know, they, they certainly protect information during the scope of the collaboration, often for a period of time afterwards. And so the question arises, or at least has arisen in court, you know, so what happens when the confidentiality obligation expires? Does that mean that the information is not confidential? You know, once that, that agreement, once the confidentiality obligation in the NDA expires. And certain courts have actually found that expiring confidentiality obligations have undermined the existence of trade secrets. So the uh, probably the most extreme example here is, is listed in the footnote, Structured Capital Solutions. And there, the court found that uh, a party's misappropriation claim failed, quote, as a matter of law, because the alleged trade secret was disclosed to a third party under an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement that had long since expired. The court stated that a temporary pledge to secrecy is exactly that, quote, temporary. Once a third party's confidentiality obligation expires, so does the trade secret protection. So not all courts um, have gone the same way on this issue, but there are other examples where courts look at these limited term obligations and find, for example, that a party's own expectations of maintaining its trade secrets were, quote, time limited. Uh, that, that quote is from the D.B. Riley case, where um, that was, you know, one of many factors that undermined the party's request for a preliminary injunction. So this is just, just one factor to keep in mind if you're entering into a collaboration and considering how to structure your agreements. The, the ultimate question is not, you know, whether there was a limit on the term of your confidentiality obligation. It'll be a more holistic, you know, do your actions reflect reasonable measures to protect secrecy? But this is just one factor to keep in mind. So what types of information are subject to trade secrecy? Uh, you know, there's really no limit. It can be technical, scientific, engineering type information. It can also be economic, business, and financial information. So now let's look at some specifics. So in the pharmaceutical industry, I would say manufacturing is a prime example of the type of information that's often not published in detail or not patented. Uh, difficult to independently develop, uh, you know, often takes years of know-how and refinement to get a, a high-quality, pure product, you know, at commercial scale, you know, ready to market. And a key example of this uh, is in the first bullet, uh, Wyeth uh, marketed Premarin, uh, you know, without, essentially without competition for more than 50 years. And it turns out that the manufacturing process for Premarin was, was quite difficult, and no one else had figured out how to do it, how to manufacture it, and how to come up with a generic product. So Wyeth enjoyed that exclusivity for over 50 years, uh, you know, until, of course, uh, a, a competitor or a potential competitor started talking to their a former Wyeth employee and obtained uh, information about Wyeth's process and suddenly made its own version. Now, this company, Natural Biolog Biologics, the court found, didn't have a credible story for how it suddenly developed a process yielding the same product. So that the manufacturing process there uh, secured over 50 years of exclusivity for, for Wyeth, and that's just kind of a nice example of how sometimes trade secret protection can give you know a greater advantage than, than patent protection, particularly if something that you really don't think that anyone else will be able to figure out on their own. So obviously, the 50 years there in Premarin is, is a lot longer than the, the 20 years from a patent. Uh, so we, we received a question at registration on protecting manufacturing by trade secrets versus patents. So it's important to note that even if the high-level process is patented, there may be features of manufacturing that are not generally known or readily ascertainable. So uh, this could be, you know, know-how that, that evolved over years, critical process parameters that, you know, aren't specifically spelled out in the patent. Uh, it could be equipment modifications. So there's all, all sorts of aspects of manufacturing that could be, continue to be held as a trade secret even if basic information is included in a patent. Oftentimes, a lot of the, the details, the, you know, the, the salt and pepper, you know, turn this style at this time, aspects of manufacturing and getting everything just right uh, may not be the type of thing that you can really see a clear path towards patenting. And so the details like that, um, often it's easier to just uh, hold as a trade secret. The second bullet here has another example of, of, of a party, PAR, asserting trade secrets related to manufacturing and also compositions, assays, and protocols related to the product of Asosif. So in PAR's complaint, they refer to this as a blatant case of trade secret theft. Uh, so a former employee went and stole documents and provided them to a competitor who then went and convinced the FDA to actually uh, list the active ingredient, the vas vasopressin, uh, as, a, as, a, as an active for, for compounding. And so PAR went to court and, and said that, you know, that this, this competitor would be using its trade secrets to manufacture the product. And they obtained a preliminary injunction against the use of all that information. That case is still pending. Um, 
Another example of trade secrets arising in the pharmaceutical context comes up in, in uh, the DUSA case, which related to uh, photodynamic therapy products, so a, you know, an illuminator and a cream. And there they, they, they actually started their case off as a patent infringement case. And after you know, a year of discovery, they added allegations of misappropriation. And they included things, you know, they, they identified their trade secrets generally as unpublished clinical results and formulations and devices and development you know, related to photodynamic therapy. And they have also obtained a preliminary injunction, although that, that case is still pending. So really, when evaluating what technology you have that may qualify for trade secret protection, one, one question to ask is, you know, is this something that would give my competitor a leg up if they were trying to develop a competing product? And I think maybe a prime example of that would be uh, the last bullet here. GlaxoSmithKline had uh, some employees steal some of their internal uh, internal research, at least as alleged in, in criminal indictments, and, and even physical samples of antibodies that had anti-cancer activity. And these employees were planning to just start up their own independent company, Renopharma, to, to develop um, and, and market uh, anti antibodies of anti-cancer activity. And so that, that theft of those trade secrets was mentioned in the news as being valued at $550 million, and it's resulted in, in criminal indictments. Another interesting case that, that's come up recently involves Merck. So um, Merck recently filed suit against a former employee in Pfizer for misappropriation of information related to vaccine development. Uh, so as alleged in the complaint, uh, back in 2011, a former employee downloaded thousands of documents related to Merck's vaccine development. And then, uh, you know, it, it joined Pfizer to begin work on vaccine development. So in, in 2017, Merck learned that this former employee was actually identified as an inventor on some of Pfizer's patents. And so then, you know, at that point, they began to investigate misconduct. And uh, eventually filed suit. And um, it, a whole host of issues have been raised in motions to dismiss that have been filed by the employee and, uh, and, and Pfizer. So Pfizer has questioned the way that Merck is identifying its trade secrets. So, um, so the, the type of technology that Merck may be targeting is, is maybe, maybe spot on, but, but how they're defining it, uh, according to Pfizer, they, they've been referring to things in such a general manner that they're capturing just general categories of technology that Merck has admitted in other proceedings is, is public information. And of course, when, when thousands of documents are stolen, there's always the option of reviewing those documents and, and seeing what sorts of combinations or compilations of information um, might might not be readily ascertainable or, or, or generally known. Um, because it's good to keep in mind, you can always have a, a trade secret asserted that is actually you know a combination of, of things that might be public, but the, the combination or compilation of that information is not something that would be generally known or readily ascertainable. Now the employee has actually said that this uh, Merck just waited too long to file the case, and they've said that fight, Merck should have figured this out uh, sooner, and the case should be thrown out um, because it, it was filed too late under the statute of limitations. So that, that, that motion is still pending, but I will note, because we had a question about information technology protections that were available for trade secrets, and in here, when it's a case of someone just downloading thousands of documents here late at night, you know, after hours, there are now products that can protect that, and they're, they're generally called data loss prevention products, so it's abbreviated DLP, so data loss prevention tools allow you to monitor employee behavior. And so if Merck had had a system like this in place back then, they, would have, they, they could have received an alert that somebody was downloading you know, an, ab an aberrantly large number of files after hours. They could have even uh, you know, put in place restrictions on access or downloading to begin with um, to, you know, to, to prevent the need for an alert just to, to stop it from happening in the first place. So if you're, if for anyone interested, those are called data loss prevention products. Now, of course, trade secrets can encompass business information also, and in the pharmaceutical context, this is, this is often uh, customer lists, which are really, you know, physician lists. So which physicians are buying the product, how much, which physicians may be interested in buying the product, and, and other information, you know, about physicians and sales. And uh, this has come up in the, the Allergen case involving Botox. They obtained uh, a permanent injunction involving the use of their confidential physician lists and sales reports. And their competitor who had obtained those lists was actually prevented from even approaching the customers identified in those lists for 10 months um, after the case. So the case involving PAR also involved customer lists, uh, competitive intelligence and business strategies, and uh, in, in the DUSA case as well with the photodynamic therapy. Again, physicians' lists were important and, and recognized in a preliminary injunction as, as 
um, the type of information that could be protected as trade secrets as well as you know business plans. Although, although in do so with the preliminary injunction, I will note that the court tried to draw an interesting line. They, they said that the competitor could not use any of the internal evaluations of physicians, so you know estimates on who would likely buy the product. Uh, the, the competitor couldn't use that information, but the court stopped short of actually preventing the competitor in that case from contacting the physicians on the list. So it's important to recognize that uh, patents and trade secrets, of course, are complementary uh, protections. So in, especially in the pharmaceutical industry, you, you very likely are going to want to patent your core inventions. But uh, somewhere along the path of development, it's also good to stop and, and, and evaluate all related technology, figure out if, if you have gaps, additional things that should be patented, but also take time to evaluate what you actually have that, that may qualify for trade secret protection. Uh, you know, either things that have fallen through the, the cracks in, in the patents that you have or, or things that, um, for whatever reason, you do want to hold as a trade secret. So it's good to conduct an audit um, at, at times just to figure out what you have. Uh, so basically assess the key technologies versus what you have in terms of patent protection. And this doesn't necessarily mean to create, you know, a list of discrete line item trade secrets, but it is good to note um, just the categories, the buckets, the areas where your trade secrets may fall. Because then you can you can really uh, target your trade secret protections, which we'll talk about more in the next segment. So it's important to know what you have first. Uh, and again, this can include, um, particularly with pharmaceuticals, aspects of manufacturing, features of the formulation that are not easy to reverse engineer, uh, ongoing research and development, successes and failures. So just think of the all the failures that you have that would you know uh, provide provide a competitor who's trying to develop competing technology a lot of useful information if they know a lot of things that didn't work so that they wouldn't have to go and try those same things. So in, keep in mind that this is an evolving process. So as you go through and you, you've patented your core, core, core technology, um, you may be holding a lot of information as trade secrets at that stage that you may later want to go and patent. So it's good to, to reassess along your development pathway. So make sure you've got the protections in place to protect trade secrets early on before they become patents. Once you've decided to, to patent those additional related inventions, it's good to continually just reassess and make sure that you've got uh, robust coverage for all aspects of your technology. And so with that, I will turn it over to Shana for segment two of our presentation. Thanks, Max, and thank you to our audience for joining us today. So let's take a look at how to protect your trade secrets and avoid disclosure. There are two major reasons to protect your trade secrets. So first, as Max mentioned, in order to have a trade secret in the first place, you must make reasonable efforts to keep the information secret. So if you sue someone for trade secret misappropriation, you should be able to articulate the measures you took to protect the information. Second, trade secret protection ends when the information is no longer secret. So if you want to have a trade secret for any length of time, you must protect it. Now, there is no clear standard for what counts as reasonable measures a company must take, but it is clear that absolute secrecy is not required. There is also a difference between best practices and what a court might accept as reasonable. In addition, the court will look to the entire record in determining whether a company took reasonable measures. Now, whether a company's steps are enough to meet the reasonable standard will depend on the circumstances. For example, it might depend on the size or nature of the business, the resources available to the business, the competitiveness of the business, or how security measures might impact the business's key activities. While there is a difference between best practices and what a court might accept as reasonable, companies should generally aim for best practices. So for example, companies should maintain a written trade secret policy. The policy should indicate that the company places importance on trade secrets and should generally identify measures that the company takes to identify and protect its trade secrets. The policy, though, should not be overly rigid or detailed. So, for example, if your policy requires that all doors are locked at 5 o'clock every single night, a defendant could later argue that you violated your own policy by not locking your doors until 8 o'clock at night. Second, companies should use legending by marking key documents and files as proprietary or confidential. 
Some companies even choose multi-level legending, where confidential documents are distinguished from proprietary documents. The difference can be in the level of importance of the document and, in turn, who actually has access to it. When exchanging documents and files with third parties, it might become important to also include your company name in the legend, so it is clear that the trade secret information belongs to you and not to that other party. Some courts have actually held that without legending, there's no sufficient notice that the document should be kept confidential. On the other hand, though, having a strict legending policy might not be practical because employees might not stamp the documents, and it could actually lead a defendant to argue that a particular document without legending violates company policy and therefore contains no trade secrets. Third, companies should restrict and monitor access to their offices and lab spaces, as well as their physical and electronic files. This might include, for example, using key fob access for the physical spaces, locked rooms or filing cabinets for the physical files, and password access for the electronic files. It may also include some of the electronic measures that Max mentioned to detect file transfers, such that the company is alerted if certain documents or large numbers of documents are being downloaded or copied. Fourth, companies should have confidentiality clauses in their employment agreements and make clear to new employees that they are barred from using their former employer's trade secrets. Companies should train employees on how to best identify and protect trade secrets, and they should encourage their employees to report any suspicious behavior. To discourage employees from improperly using or disclosing your trade secrets, the training could also include case examples about the possible civil and even criminal consequences for trade secret misappropriation. Fifth, companies should use confidentiality agreements or non-disclosure agreements with third parties, including collaborators, licensors, licensees, and vendors. Ideally, you should be disclosing as little information as possible to these third parties. But if you must disclose the information, then you should have confidentiality agreements in place. And as Max mentioned, you need to monitor the expiration dates for those agreements. Six, trade secret misappropriation often happens when an employee leaves a company. So companies should promptly terminate data access upon learning that an employee is leaving. They should also have procedures to ensure that departing employees return company property as well as confidential information. Companies should also use exit interviews and, if possible, departing employee confidentiality agreements. These agreements should acknowledge that the departing employee's obligation of confidentiality continue even when they start their new job, and that if there are questions, they should contact the company, not the new employer. Seventh, and perhaps most important, companies should not disclose their trade secrets. So this may seem like common sense, but there are numerous cases where trade secrets were lost because the information was disclosed in publications, at trade shows, patent filings, and in dealings with third parties. Eighth, if you discover that someone has improperly accessed or used your trade secrets, you should act promptly to minimize the disclosure and to enforce your trade secrets. So while there is no clear standard for what constitutes reasonable measures, we can gain some insights by looking at a few examples. So in 2003, the U.S. District Court for the District of Minnesota ruled in Wyeth versus Natural Biologics that Wyeth had taken reasonable steps to protect its trade secrets. So this is one of the cases that Max mentioned, where Wyeth had maintained its manufacturing process for Primarin as trade secret, even though the patents had expired. So the court pointed to a host of measures that Wyeth had taken to protect its manufacturing process as a trade secret. For example, Wyeth had security, um, including fencing, controlled gate access, closed circuit cameras, and a guard force. It limited the access to its plant, including by requiring badges, using sign-in and sign-out sheets, and having card access door entry. It also placed limits on file access, including by using locked and user-protected copiers, locked filing cabinets, and locked rooms and it provided information to its employees and third parties on a need-to-know basis only. Wyeth also required new employees to sign confidentiality agreements, 
It briefed its employees on the importance of confidentiality, and for certain key documents, Wyeth actually required employees to check them out. Wyeth also gave contractors a handbook with confidentiality requirements applicable to them and required contractors to destroy or return documents when a project ended. In its required government submissions about chemical waste, Wyeth took precautions to not disclose its trade secrets related to its process. And so based on all of this, the court concluded that reasonable steps were taken. In 2012, the Central District of California found a much smaller list of efforts reasonable in Allergan versus MERS Pharmaceuticals. So this is another case that Max mentioned, which involved Allergan's trade secrets for its Botox product. The court noted that Allergan had contract prohibitions on disclosing and using the confidential information. It used password protections and restricted access to its electronic data. It used legending and it immediately terminated employees' access to data upon notice that the employee was leaving. So although these were not as extensive as the best practices list that we talked about, or even the list of measures in the Wyeth case, the court here concluded that Allergan took reasonable measures to protect its trade secrets. In contrast to the Wyeth and Allergan cases, the Southern District of Ohio found in 1997 that Hoffman LaRoche had not taken reasonable steps to protect certain information related to its Accutane product. The company had no written or oral agreement of confidentiality with its clinical investigators. It used minimal legending on its confidential documents and widely distributed those documents to more than 200 clinical investigators and institutional review committee members nationwide. Hoffman LaRoche also had no system for retrieving or destroying documents when the clinical studies were over. In addition, the company did not bar the clinical investigators from publishing articles about the studies and did not object when several articles were published. All of this led the court to conclude that the information at issue was not trade secret because reasonable steps were not taken. So I'd like to talk now in more detail about a 2019 case on reasonable measures. This is the case by Genentech against JHL Biotech and various individuals in the Northern District of California. So according to the court decision, Genentech had maintained trade secrets related to its biologic products Avastin, Pulmazine, Rituxan, and Herceptin. These secrets included validated analytical methods, product formulation information, and manufacturing and operation protocols, including GMP-compliant procedures. Genentech sued JHL and various individuals for misappropriation of these trade secrets, arguing that JHL improperly obtained and used the trade secret information to develop biosimilars of the four products. Now, in this case, Genentech had taken several measures that the defendants agreed were reasonable. So these included limiting access to confidential information, having confidentiality agreements, prohibiting the unauthorized disclosure of use of confidential information, and storing information in password-protected repositories. The defendants nonetheless argued that Genentech was not reasonable in its measures because it had waited 11 months after receiving an anonymous tip about trade secret misappropriation before firing the defendant employee, Xanthi Lamb. Now, in trade secret law, there are often cases that are close calls on whether a defendant's behavior was improper. Based on the facts here, as presented in the court's decision, this is not one of those cases. So, Lamb started working at Genentech in 1986. More than 20 years later, she became secretly employed at Genentech's competitor, JHL, while still working for Genentech. Her employment at JHL included editing and improving JHL's protocols relating to its biosimilars of Genentech's products. And to do this, she used confidential information from Genentech. Lamb also secretly downloaded confidential documents from Genentech and transmitted them to JHL through her husband, who was a former Genentech employee who had moved to JHL. According to the court decision, Lamb had also helped her friend's son get a job at JHL, and then she had coached and supervised him in his employment there. 
She also helped another friend get a job at JHL and allowed that friend to use her Genentech login credentials to download hundreds of Genentech confidential documents. So after Genentech received its anonymous tip from another employee in October of 2016, it promptly notified the U.S. Attorney's Office. According to the court decision, the FD, FBI launched its own investigation, and at the government's request, Genentech refrained from initiating a civil suit. So instead, Genentech closely tracked Lamb's activities, and in October of 2017, one month after the FBI searched Lamb's home, that's when Genentech fired Lamb. Although the defendants argued that the 11 months between the tip and the firing meant that Genentech did not reasonably protect its trade secrets, the court here disagreed. It found that Genentech's efforts were reasonable given the circumstances. Now, as a side note, Lamb, her husband, and the two friends were indicted last year, and that criminal case is scheduled for trial next April. The civil case against those defendants is postponed until the criminal case is resolved. In the meantime, JHL announced last month that the civil case against it had been settled. JHL noted that it had agreed to immediately forego further development and clinical trials of its products and to reimburse Genentech for legal fees and the cost of the investigation. Now, I mentioned that you should not disclose your trade secrets, and again, that may seem like common sense, but companies have lost their trade secret protections because the information was disclosed. So I'd like to now turn to some notes on avoiding disclosure of your trade secrets in FDA submissions, PTO submissions, and litigations. So first, the FDA is really striving uh, to provide transparency. And it will also disclose information pursuant to a FOIA request unless the information qualifies for an exemption. So one of those exemptions is that the information is trade secret. And under FDA regulations, trade secrets consist of any commercially valuable plan, formula, process, or device that is used for the making, preparing, compounding, or processing of trade commodities, and that can be said to be the end product of either innovation or substantial effort. And it's important to note that for the exemption under FDA regulations, there must be a direct relationship between the trade secret and the productive process. So for your FDA filings, you should avoid including trade secret information, if at all possible. But there are obviously times when you may need, may need to include trade secret formulations, manufacturing methods, um, or clinical study reports, for example. If so, what you should do is designate in writing that the information is trade secret and exempt under Exemption 4 of the Freedom of Information Act. Under FDA regulations, the designation must be made at the time of your submission or within a reasonable time thereafter. And it's important to note that the designation here expires 10 years after submission of the information. Also, if you are designating material as trade secret, you should be prepared to explain, if necessary, why the information is valuable, and why its disclosure would harm your company. Now, if the FDA receives a FOIA request for records, it will make reasonable efforts to notify the company that submitted those records. The company then has five working days to object. If the FDA decides to disclose the records, it will notify the company and explain why the objections were not sustained. The FDA will then disclose the records five working days later unless ordered not to by a U.S. District Court. If the FDA denies a FOIA request, the requester may challenge the decision in court. And in these cases, the FDA may require the submitter of the information to intervene, and if they don't, the FDA may consider that in deciding whether to release the records. So let's turn now to some notes on avoiding disclosure of trade secrets in PTO submissions. So the PTO seeks to have complete file wrappers, but it also wants to prevent the unnecessary disclosure of trade secrets. So just like with FDA filings, you should avoid including trade secret information if at all possible. If you have to include trade secret information in your PTO submissions, you should clearly label the information as trade secret 
and identify it as such in your transmittal letter. You should also file a petition to expunge before the PTO issues a notice of allowability or a notice of abandonment. If the information, though, is found to be material to patentability, your motion to expunge will likely be denied. In addition, if any trade secrets are submitted in amendments, arguments in favor of patentability, or affidavits, then they will be made of record in the file. Now, for submissions to the PTO relating to patent term extensions, you should identify the trade secret material by page, line, and word as necessary. You should also file a petition to expunge before the PTO issues the PTE certificate. If, however, the information was material to determining eligibility or any other PTO responsibility under Section 156, the motion to expunge will be denied. If the PTO receives a FOIA request for information, it will notify, notify the applicant and give the applicant an opportunity to respond. You should also avoid disclosing trade secrets in litigation by introducing trade secret information only if necessary, filing documents and exhibits under seal, and requesting a closed courtroom for hearings and trial. So for example, in 1996, the Eastern District of North Carolina ruled in Glaxo versus Novafarm that process information for Glaxo's Santac product was not trade secret because it had been disclosed in a previous litigation. More specifically, Glaxo had filed 135 unsealed exhibits, including documents reflecting the manufacturing processes. The trial was held in open court with competitors in attendance, and the information was discussed in the previous court's opinion without redaction or objection. And so based on this, the court found in its 1996 decision that the information had not been held as trade secret. And with that, I will turn it over to John to talk about enforcement. Thank you, Shana. Uh, at this point, we're going to shift gears a little bit and address enforcement of trade secrets. So in the circumstances where you're, you're fortunate enough to have detected misappropriation and you would want to enforce your trade secrets, what are your options? What are your remedies? Uh, for the most part, the discussion will center on enforcing trade secrets in state and federal courts in the United States under our respective state and federal laws. But before I proceed with that discussion, I did want to note that there are other ways to enforce trade secrets. For example, if the circumstances are appropriate, companies might opt to resolve their trade secret misappropriation disputes through private arbitration. Uh, th this course usually involves disputes between sophisticated parties that wish to narrow the issues, limit the, their discovery, and, and sort of litigate behind closed doors before an arbitration panel that has been given a narrow, a relatively narrow mandate compared to uh, full-blown litigation. This can sometimes be a cheaper and faster alternative to traditional litigation and is, is often used in, in the appropriate circumstances. Uh, another example might be a trade secret owner that pursues relief by bringing a Section 337 action before the International Trade Commission. Those can also be based on trade secret misappropriation. This, this option is only available where the facts involve importation, uh, importation of a product where the complainant also maintains a domestic industry in the United States, uh, among many other requirements to file to, at the ITC. But in certain circumstances, trade secret owners will seek an exclusion order before the ITC rather than, or, or sometimes in addition to, pursuing litigation in state or federal courts. Uh, and, and international fora are also available to pursue either local or kind of a parallel worldwide enforcement litigation strategy. The, the EU Directive on Trade Secrets, as well as unfair competition laws in Japan, as two examples, they both reflect similar principles that are found in, in U.S. law when it comes to respecting and enforcing a trade secret owner's rights. Now, not every local jurisdiction has such laws, but there are, uh, there are situations in which parallel worldwide enforcement may involve local, 
local forums as well. So, so while I'll be addressing state and federal law in the United States, that is certainly not the exclusive mechanism for, for trade secret enforcement. The, the Defend Trade Secret Act, um, I'm sure many of you are, are aware of this at this point. It was enacted in 2016. It's an amendment to the Economic Espionage Act, which is a criminal statute, and it creates a private civil right of action in federal court. S substantively, this law is largely based on the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. So for the fundamentals, such as the definition of a trade secret, the elements of misappropriation, uh, some of the things that, that Max and, and Shana have covered already. There's no real difference between many of the state laws that have on, been on the books for decades now and this new federal law. There, there are some differences. Uh, for instance, a statute of limitations under the Defend Trade Secret Act is three years, whereas state law can vary from as little as two years to as much as six years. But in many respects, the, the acts are, are all very uniform and, and similar now. The, the federal law does include an ex parte seizure provision. Uh, it also includes certain whistleblower protections that are not found in state law. The, the ex parte seizure provision in particular was controversial when, when the law was first enacted. It basically enables a trade secret owner to petition the court, federal court, for an order that would require the U.S. Marshals to seize a defendant's property, seize the property in order to stop ongoing dissemination or use of a trade secret under certain conditions. And a number of detractors from this, this statutory framework saw potential for, for commercial abuse there. But in practice, now that we are several years in, we see that federal courts rarely grant that ex parte relief the, the handful of opinions that we have seen granting such relief involve very extreme circumstances, m mostly where a defendant has already shown sort of disdain for the rule of law or is actively engaged in destruction of evidence. In your run-of-the-mill civil commercial dispute, courts aren't granting ex parte seizure orders. They're opting instead to consider expedited relief under well-worn principles such as preliminary injunctions, uh, and temporary restraining orders as an alternative. Uh, but before the DTSA was enacted, a trade secret owner could bring a state law-based cause of action for trade secret misappropriation in federal court if it could satisfy the requirements for diversity jurisdiction or supplemental jurisdiction. With the DTSA, there's no longer a need to resort to those jurisdictional hooks. In essence, you can file directly in federal court. We're seeing more cases filed in federal court. There's been a renewed focus on misappropriation actions given the passage of the DTSA. I suspect there are fewer cases filed in state court, but there certainly is an uptick in federal court. And, and a trade secret own, owner using the U.S. courts now to enforce its trade secrets essentially has three options. It, it can bring a state law-based action in state court, uh, just as in the past. It can bring a federal law-based action in federal court, or most commonly what we're seeing is a, an action in federal court based on both state and federal law. So those are the three procedural options for enforcement. When considering enforcement in state versus federal courts, uh, because the substantive law is not significantly different, the primary difference lies in procedure. Federal courts, as we know, follow uniform rules in civil practice, but local civil rules, standing orders, local procedures, they can vary significantly between different federal courts. Uh, there can be a good bit of diversity on things such as discovery practice, time to trial, summary judgment procedures, length of trial, and, and other procedural mat matters that are at the discretion of the district court. So a trade secret owner looking to enforce must keep these considerations in mind and, and sort of carefully evaluate the differences in the local practices of various federal courts that might be an appropriate venue for an enforcement litigation. And, and there may be several appropriate venues. Tra trade secret owners are not constrained by the TC Heartland venue considerations that apply to patent infringement litigation. So venue might be appropriate where the plaintiff is located, where the defendant is located, where trade secrets were misappropriated, uh, where the harm is felt, 
where products or services are provided, uh, and, and even where the trade secret was created. So you can look at different options for venue. All federal courts are going to apply Rule 65 to address TROs and preliminary injunctions. They've been doing this for decades in other contexts, patent infringement, trademark, copyright cases. And because trade secret owners are often most concerned with stopping the offending conduct, federal courts are a great forum to get a quick decision when the circumstances warrant a uh, quick preliminary relief decision. And federal court orders in this respect are enforceable nationwide. There are some limits on the scope of injunctive relief available under the DTSA. Uh, amendments were made to the act to prevent application of the inevitable disclosure doctrine. And that means a couple of things. Injunctions in federal court under the DTSA cannot prevent a person from entering into a future employment relationship that cannot be uh, part of the scope of the injunction. There can be conditions that are placed on future employment, but any conditions placed on employment must be based on evidence of threatened misappropriation as opposed to information that that person simply knows from prior employment. Injunctions also cannot otherwise conflict with an applicable state law prohibiting restraints on the practice of lawful professions or trades or business. And so in that sense, the federal law has to actually yield to applicable state law, meaning that the scope of injunctions under the federal DTSA might be different depending upon which specific state law may apply to the defendant's conduct. So even if a trade secret owner chooses to enforce in federal court under federal law exclusively, it remains important to investigate and understand certain aspects of governing state law. Uh, finally, the last bullet on this slide, uh, Section 1837 of the Act is entitled Applicability to Conduct Outside of the United States. With the global nature of business ventures and supply chains, there's a great deal of focus on how any particular jurisdiction's laws might be enforceable in an extraterritorial or quasi-extraterritorial manner. So under this section, both criminal and civil actions are available irrespective of where in the world trade secret misappropriation occurs, as long as one of two conditions are met. One is that the offender is a U.S. citizen or corporation, or the second is an act in furtherance of the offense was committed in the United States. So the nature and the scope of that second provision has yet to be interpreted and applied. In my personal view, uh, I, I would imagine that courts are likely to interpret that very broadly. Acts in furtherance being committed in the United States might be as simple as an email or phone call uh, involved in the factual background leading up to the misappropriation. Taking a quick look at state law here, each of the 50 states has its own statutory or common law governing enforcement of, of the trade secrets. State legislatures over the course of, of several decades now have used the UTSA, Uniform Trade Secrets Act, as a starting point for state statutes. So as a result, many of the 49 state statutes governing trade secret misappropriation are very similar in substance. State law remains viable in every respect after the DTSA. There, there is no federal preemption. So the state trade secret framework, it's more akin to trademark law, which contemplates actions under the federal Lanham Act as well as state law, than it is to patent law, for example, in which federal law preempts any state regulation, state law in, in the entire field, the subject matter field. Again, because state and federal laws are so similar substantively, the most important considerations for trade secret enforcement are often focused on procedural differences. For instance, in, in many state courts, a plaintiff does not need a unanimous jury vote to win. So a plaintiff in California wins in a 9-3 split, for example, whereas that would be a hung jury in federal court. In many state courts, it's also extremely difficult for a defendant to obtain summary judgment before trial. And in comparison, federal court judges will focus heavily on summary judgment and partial summary judgment, oftentimes as part of case management. So it's easier to get to a jury in, in state court. And statistically speaking, plaintiffs are seeing win rates near 75% for trade secret cases that reach a jury. And that's in both state and federal courts, near 75%.
So it's no surprise that traditionally plaintiff's attorneys want to get to a jury and plaintiff's attorneys traditionally appear to prefer to be in state court for a number of these kind of intangible reasons. So while we're seeing a spike in federal court actions under the DTSA, it is important to keep in mind that state court options may be uh, a viable uh, alternative in, in considering enforcement. We have seen some, some high profile state court litigations in the pharmaceutical context, uh, significant trade secret misappropriation case between Amgen and Coherus was litigated in California state court exclusively two years ago uh, concerning Amgen's Nulasta product, uh, which is a biologic to treat the side effects from cancer therapy. Co Coherus had pursued a biosimilar of Nulasta and Amgen had le alleged that Coherus enjoyed a significant head start advantage in that pursuit due to uh, trade secret misappropriation that involved many former Amgen employees leaving to, to join Coherus, to actually found the company and join the company, as well as uh, alleged misappropriation of 55 USB drives containing highly sensitive uh, information. And the point here is that the case was filed in state court under state law, despite that the DTSA and federal court would have presumably been, been available to Amgen because the case was filed in 2017. So state court remains a viable and, and a, a alternative and one that, that is consistently, remains to be consistently used in enforcement. Uh, I've turned to the slide on remedies. I'll spend some time here because this is arguably the most important aspect of any trade secret enforcement effort. The remedies outlined here are consistent, largely consistent between state and federal law. They're outlined and identified in the respective statutory frameworks. The first is actual loss, and that's actual loss to the trade secret owner. That would involve, for example, what we think of as lost profits in the patent context. context. That would be lost sales that occurred, uh, lost sales to the trade secret owner that occurred because of the misappropriation. So very similar to patent law and the use of the Panduit factors, for example, to establish that, that causal link or causation between the misappropriation and lost sales. Uh, under the statutes, a trade secret owner can recover damages for any unjust enrichment that is not duplicative of the plaintiff's actual loss. Un unjust enrichment can take many different forms here. Uh, the most common form is disgorgement. And that's a remedy requiring the defendant to account for or disgorge its actual profits. So you're getting the defendant's profits instead of the plaintiff's loss profits. It's it's in an interesting opinion, the, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit just last year uh, held that a plaintiff does not have a Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial on the issue of disgorgement type unjust enrichment damages for trade secret misappropriation. Uh, and, and this is a, a pretty significant change in the law because plaintiffs, I, I think, traditionally did rely on uh, a right to a jury trial for unjust enrichment disgorgement damages in the past that the federal circuit uh, was was applying Texas law in this case but the reasoning and conclusions regarding disgorgement did not seem to be state specific so that's a good case to be aware of it's uh, it's Texas advanced optoelectronic solutions versus Renaissance and the citation is 895 F third 1304, and that's a significant, uh, arguable change in the law on disgorgement damages for unjust enrichment. Uh, typically, a plaintiff is going to want the jury to decide the damages issues as well as liability. So this decision is something to keep in mind when enforcing trade secrets and uh, deciding whether to pursue a disgorgement theory for unjust enrichment damages, given that that might involve forfeiting the right to a jury decision on, on just that issue. That would then be a bench issue, unjust enrichment for, for disgorgement. But there are other theories for unjust enrichment damages in the trade secret context that a trade secret owner could pursue. That would include Head Start damages to measure economic gains that were achieved by any Head Start that was enabled through the trade secret misappropriation. So 
getting to market more quickly. Uh, the trade secret could also actually be valued under a cost approach, an income approach, or a market approach. And that valuation could then be asserted as unjust enrichment damages, the actual economic value of what had been misappropriated. The plaintiff might also focus on the research and development costs that the defendant avoided by misappropriating the trade secret rather than developing its own technology from scratch. So all, all of these are viable economic theories under the unjust enrichment umbrella. Uh, the statute also includes a reference to a reasonable royalty. Here, courts look at the same typically look at the same Georgia Pacific factors that are analyzed when considering patent infringement, reasonable royalty damages. Uh, permanent injunctive relief is available. We've talked a little bit about preliminary injunctive relief, but permanent injunctive relief is also available for a prevailing trade secret owner that can establish entitlement to, to such relief. The traditional factors of irreparable harm and uh, lack of a remedy at law. And the last two bullet points here, they apply to cases involving willful and malicious, malicious appropriation. So there's a multiplier for exemplary damages and a fee shifting provision. W willfulness alone is, is not really enough as willfulness and intent are arguably part of the underlying proofs of a misappropriation case. There, there really has to be something more, uh, something truly malicious in terms of conduct to warrant exemplary damages and attorney's fees in this context. So that is uh, a summary of remedies in a nutshell. I'm actually going to, to skip the last four slides here so we can take some questions, but the last four slides, uh, they're self-explanatory. The citations are here and they are to cover two recent cases that involve uh, a plaintiff bringing both a DTSA claim and a parallel uh, or attendant state law UTSA action. Uh, the facts and circumstances are all laid out here, uh, but rather than proceed through those for the group here, I'll turn it back over to Megan to see if we have any uh, questions from the audience. Thanks, John. We definitely do have questions from the audience, but before we begin the question and answer part of our event, Please take a moment to complete our brief evaluation survey, and then we're going to turn to some questions that we received throughout the presentation. As a reminder, to participate in the Q&A, you can just click on the Q&A button and type a question into the window and then click Submit. So our first question we're going to turn to um, was from an audience member. So as to the confidentiality agreement or NDA expiration date monitoring that we talked about earlier, wouldn't it be best to have the agreement state that the obligations as to the trade secret survive indefinitely or for so long as it's maintained as a trade secret per applicable law, or does that have enforceability issues? And, and Megan, uh, this is Max, I can speak to that. So, so absolutely, yes, that the ideal would be to have the confidentiality agreement or, or NDA um, the, whatever confidentiality restrictions are in there that relate to trade secrets, the idea would be that those do not expire. Um, and so there's limits on that, obviously. So to the extent that the information becomes public through no fault of the, you know, the party, to the, the, the party receiving the information in the agreement, um, then, then it would no longer qualify as a trade secret. But certainly that would be the ideal. It would be much like a provision in an employee agreement where, you know, that when you have access to the trade secret, you're, you're not allowed to then go and, and, and use or, or disclose it outside the terms of the agreement. Uh, for some reason, that, that's just not how a lot of these agreements end up, So, which is part of the reason why we wanted to include it in this presentation, just to make sure companies were aware that um, this is something that courts look at. And so it is something to keep in mind when drafting these contracts. You do want an enduring confidentiality obligation for, for actual trade secrets that are shared under the agreement. Great, thanks, Max. Um, our next question, which we got a couple of questions, about this um, was how do you balance the best mode requirement in patent law with keeping trade secrets? Oh, this is Shane. I can take that one. Um, so certainly the balance between disclosing best mode in your patent and maintaining your trade secrets can prove challenging, and I think that's probably why we got a few questions about it. So some commenters are noting that although best mode is still a requirement under AIA, Failing to disclose best mode is no longer a basis for invalidating your patent claims. 
I would say that it's important to remember that the requirement applies only at the time of filing. So if, for example, your company comes up with a better way to manufacture your drug after your application is filed, you can then protect that new manufacturing process as trade secret without violating the best mode requirement. In addition, the best mode requirement applies only to the best mode contemplated by the inventors. So if someone else at the company has a better way to manufacture the drug, then it arguably does not need to be disclosed. Um, and this was actually one of the rulings in the Glaxo Novafarm case that I mentioned from the 1990s. Thanks, Shana. Um, our next question, and John touched on this a little bit during his portion, but it was in regards to explaining a little bit further about the differences between trade secret damages and patent damages. Sure. Th this is John. I can I can elaborate on that a, a little bit more. Uh, it, obviously, there are a number of parallels between patent damages and trade secret damages in that uh, the actual loss portion under the trade secret statute is is kind of parallel in some respects to lost profits, and reasonable royalties are available in both contexts. I think the biggest difference is is clearly is the unjust enrichment uh, option for a trade secret litigant uh the, the the fifth circuit has gone so far as to explain uh there's a case indicating that there's a very flexible and creative approach to damages in the context of trade secret misappropriation and the the many different theories and and mechanisms to pursue damages under that unjust enrichment umbrella really aren't available to a, a, a patent litigant. We are seeing, despite that, we are seeing that some of the case law limitations and constraints that we're all becoming familiar with in the context of patent damages, the, the court developed uh, or common law limitations and constraints, uh, such as the entire market value rule and apportionment requirements and some of the, the strictures that the Federal Circuit is insisting upon as to the, the Daubert and admissibility of, of expert opinions in those respects, that uh, that analysis is carrying over into trade secret litigations now that many of those are happening in federal courts. So we are seeing courts requiring uh, apportionment, for example, but between trade secrets for 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 in certain circumstances where a plaintiff is asserting many trade secrets, uh, a courts some courts in certain circumstances are asking for an analysis that apportions the damages award among the various trade secrets. We're also seeing uh, apportionment in the in the kind of entire market value rule context requirements that that a trade secret owner is is required to link the success of its product and the sales of its product to the asserted trade secret rather than other aspects of the product that may be driving sales. So we are seeing some parallels in the analyses, but um, but the main difference is that unjust enrichment piece that is available for, for trade secret owners. Thanks, John. Um, our next question was related to the um, reasonable measures requirement and it was that now that data loss prevention products are available, do courts expect that companies that use such products have employed reasonable measures to protect trade secrets? And if they don't, has that led to a finding of failure to take reasonable measures? Uh, thanks, Megan. I can. This is Max. I can take that question. Um, so I'm not aware of a case where a court has said that not implementing a data loss prevention tool has has defeated uh, you know other reasonable measures that were employed by a company, but they have been cited in at least one case um, to support reasonable measures. So there's a case involving Intel with an opinion out from from January of this year, where the court found that Intel took reasonable steps to keep information secret uh, by managing electronic access to the materials and using a data loss prevention program, and, and also having confidentiality agreements in place. Great, thanks, Max. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, when do we need to decide whether to disclose information in a patent application or protect it as a trade secret? Um, so this is Shana and I can speak to that one. First of all, it's important to remember that patents and trade secrets can complement each other as we've talked about. And so you can actually use both for your products. Um, so you might be able to patent the active ingredient while maintaining improvements in the manufacturing process as trade secrets. 
if you do have specific information that you are trying to decide on whether to disclose it in your patent application or protect it as trade secret, though, the answer is that it really is best to decide as soon as possible, ideally before you file your patent application. That said, you can delay the decision between patent and trade secret um, by filing your patent application with the information and then deciding before it publishes or issues as a patent. So either 18 months when it publishes or if you request and receive non-publication, then it won't publish until the patent actually issues. Um, so if you maintain your patent application in secrecy, you can actually delay um, and having to decide between patent and trade secret until really you get a better idea of the scope of the claims that you're going to get. So if you, if you don't like the scope of the claims that you're going to get in a patent, you could then technically abandon your application and instead continue to protect that information as trade secret. Great. Thanks, Shana. And thanks, everyone, for attending today's webcast, Trade Secrets in the Pharmaceutical Industry. This presentation will be available on demand in the next week. Please look for an email from us with the, with the access link. This now concludes today's webcast. Thank you for participating.